Today's case study is going to be on Snowflake, and I hope I'm going to unlock your brain so that you can understand applicability of a super high-tech company that had an IPO that gave it a value of $70 billion. I'm going to walk you through. And first, I'm going to unlock my brain with a vault. And all of you that know me know that my favorite flavor is black cherry, but there's also watermelon, cucumber mint. You can order them at Amazon, get yourself, get yourself a case, no sugar, no caffeine, and just the right amount of pop. So now I'm going to go down to Studio B and we're going to dive in to Snowflake. All right, I found my board, my lovely board. Love it, love it. And I got my vault. Unlock your brain with a vault, just like I hope I unlock your brain right now with Snowflake. So what were we talking about? We're talking about AI, we're talking about storage. There's so many things going on. And not too many weeks ago, I did a case study on NVIDIA. And if you go back and look at that one, I'm about to talk about Snowflake, which is an NVIDIA partner, and you're about to see why and how. So what is Snowflake? People have heard about storage. Hey, what is an enabler for you know, AI? What does storage for AI mean? What, is, um, a, what does flip my data or dive into my data mean? Well, let's go take a look at it. So who is Snowflake? Snowflake, in short, is a cloud-based data warehouse called the Snowflake Data Cloud and analytics platform, and they let clients like you and me store, manage, and analyze our data in one place. Like data from multiple points of a company all comes together, like sales data, and finance needs to do this and make uh, earnings reports. But marketing wants to know where did those customers come from? And sales wants to know how are my customers similar or dissimilar? Guess what? All of that can go into one Snowflake database, and all three could be in there working with the data to get answers and insights to run the business better and make this better decisions tomorrow. So it's ideal for companies that need to scale quickly or for those that have multiple teams, like I just described, that are processing data at the same time. The scenario I just gave to you would be real world, where you maybe have three, four, five groups inside of a company finance and analytics for finance and a forecasting group and a customer service group and maybe the head of sales all have different questions they want answered from that same bucket of customer data. Snowflake would let them do exactly that. So that's what the company is and does. So what's with going on with these headlines? Well, <clears throat> we're going to get to the current headlines and some things that are going on that may or may not be good news. But first, let me step back in time. June 2023, but we're not going back very far in time. We're going back eight months, six to eight months. Partnering with NVIDIA, Snowflake aims at a $100 billion generative AI market. Well, guess what? There he is. There's um, Frank Slootman and NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang holding a, a snowboard, which has got everybody's logo on it. And so they're talking about snowboarding together, you know, doing things together, whatnot and how they're both gonna to be together. What's significant? NVIDIA's got these data centers powered by those NVIDIA chips, and Snowflake has got all these tools to help you work with generative AI. The thinking was that customers of NVIDIA that wanna use their AI data centers would be using Snowflake as the storage and the manipulation engine. Ta da so they thought this would be a pretty good marriage and we get more customers for Snowflake that are using NVIDIA. So both of the market reacted pretty well. They're like, okay, that's good. That certainly is promising. Well, eight months later, headlines in March, Snowflake's conservative FY25 guidance. Now let me stop right there. They're on a fiscal year. Their fiscal year ends in January of each year. So when they say fiscal year 25, they're really saying ending January 25, which basically means 2024 sales. Make sense? So you have to think one month and one year back for them. So Snowflake's conservative guidance for calendar year 24 and the CEO transition. Uh-oh. CEO transition. Didn't give the market a lot of notice. The old CEO was uh, beloved. Can't do that. Market gets a little bit fussy. Stirred the analyst debates. Now the analysts are like, what do I do with these guys? They've had kind of a flat year. Do I make them up or down? And optimism for AI in a vision amid cautious forecasts. So new CEO, cautious guidance, 
cautious forecast. So that's what the market wants. The market wants to know, I'm going to the moon, man. We're going to get an Elon Musk rocket, and we're going to go to the moon. Well, that's not what they got. Then Snowflake was downgraded at Morgan Stanley. Here's why. That's what happened. That's what happened. Then Snowflake, the stock tanked 20%. Remember, I'm talking this as you're watching right now in Mar early March of 2024. You're seeing the fiscal year 25 stuff for Snowflake, but they just had a 20% market drop because of conservative forecasts. The CEO is leaving. He's actually retiring. He's not, he's not leaving. There's no scandal. There's nothing going on. So this isn't good for Snowflake. And lastly, Motley Fool comes out again at the same time, says, hang on, guys. We think there's three artificial intelligence stocks that could be worth a trillion dollars someday, and we think Snowflake's one of them. So what Motley Fool is saying, hey, maybe ignore all this. As long as the new CEO is as good as the old CEO, Snowflake's got stuff. They have a partnership with NVIDIA. Let's give them time to show us what they can do. We think it could be a trillion dollar market cap company. So in other words, Snowflake's in the middle of a slushy spring. See what I did there? <clears throat> so now what? Here's where it began. We're gonna start with the founders. Three guys, and I think, I think they're all French. I know two of them are. So it was founded in San Mateo, California, which is right next to San Francisco airport. So this is the Bay Area, the northern edge of the Silicon Valley in 2012. And Benoit Dugueville uh, was an Oracle architect. Terry Kuranis, was an Oracle architect, and Marcin Zukowski was with Vectorwise. So these were smart guys working with Oracle and other companies that came together that says, hey, we think there's room for a very interesting cloud-based solution here that allows people to do things with data. Now, AI was coming, but it wasn't on the tip of everybody's tongue, because this now goes back 13 years ago, and away they go. So they were stealth for two years, um, and then they came out stealth with 80 customers, they were beta users, you know, early customers, hey, you can use this for a really cheap price. And they raised $26 million at that point and hired Bob Muglia to be their CEO. So they found a Microsoft CEO. So on paper, you got Oracle guys, 80 customers, 26 million raised. Seems like it's off to a reasonable start for a technology startup. And they're barely 10 years ago, keep that in mind, that they actually came out and said, here we are, we got 80 customers, and they allowed other people to start using it. So let's go through funding and management at this era. First of all, 2015, a year later, they raised another 45 million and launched officially the product that would be the Snowflake Cloud, the data warehouse. Warehouse where you store things, data warehouse where you store your data. <clears throat> then two years later, now remember they had you know, two double digit millions, but nothing huge. But then in 17, they raised a, a hundred million dollars and it was the next version of the cloud data warehouse. Then 2018, a year later, look what happened. So you see where this is going, 2018. Four years after coming out of stealth, they raised 263 million at a $1.5 billion and they joined the Unicorn Club. Unicorn, a startup that someone thinks that is a investor putting a valuation on it is worth 1.5 billion. Then they raised almost half a billion dollars at a $3.5 billion valuation led by Sequoia in the same year. So as you can see, this is where the momentum was, whoosh, four years after getting started, people are like, oh, we get it. We know what's going on. And now 2018, that's immediately pre-COVID, but now AI is on people's lips talking about manipulating data, data warehouses are big, there's a lot of things going on. Here you go. <clears throat> 2019, they recruited Frank Slootman, the CEO, he was with ServiceNow. ServiceNow, fantastic company, and he had taken them through their IPO, and they were doing very well. So this guy had driven companies that were gonna be big, like Snowflake, in the tech center, and had the success of an IPO and great leadership under his belt. This was seen as a great, great hire. Six years at, at uh, ServiceNow and leading that IPO. So he had kind of retired in quotation marks, made a bunch of money at ServiceNow, and figure out what he's gonna do. Then to 2020, they raised another 479 million, almost half a billion, 
and announced they had 3,400 customers. So look, between 2018 and 20, they raised uh, a billion and a quarter, really off and running. So what happens next? <clears throat> They're serving their customers. So they were generating at this time, now they've got a really mature uh, product set out there that's really beloved. They have the majority of their revenue from um, customers that do one of three things. They buy resources and processing from Snowflake while their data is there. They get charged if they com compute things, like you start flipping your data around and, and analyzing it, like with the N NVIDIA chipsets and everything. You get char charged for what you store and for data transfer, moving data from here to there. So they're saying, hey, transfer the data in, we charge it for that, store it, we'll charge it for that. And then once it's there, you want to start doing uh, computational things with that, like the example I use, where the marketing people want to know insights about the customer. The salespeople want to see uh, segmentation of the customer. Finance wants to dive in a little bit as they make forecasts based on the customers, and everybody does it at the same time, computing the data that's in storage that was transferred there. Ta-da! That is how you're a customer of Snowflake. And this stuff is really strong and good for AI. Well, how did they become better? I thought Amazon stored stuff, Tom. I thought Microsoft and Google stored stuff. Well, yeah, they do. But what Snow Snowflake did that was very clever, they made their data warehouse really fast, really easy to use, and cost effective and elastic. In other words, you could expand and contract the amount of storage you needed quickly. Most other data warehouses, not all of them, but most of the leading ones, were rigid in what you could and couldn't do, expensive, and often very difficult to manipulate and do. Snowflake said, let's make it easy, even for a mid-sized company that doesn't have 20 people in IT, to move their data on board, store it here, and start doing data flops and other things and analytics and analysis of that data. And guess what? It worked. This is exactly where people saw Snowflake as being you know, this, the fast, easy, cost-effective partner. But some people would say, no, nope, too new. I'm going to use some of the established people. So they were overcoming that. So, But you can make yourself pretty legitimate by making yourself visible to the, that's right, public. As a public company, go have an IPO. So 2020, it, the IPO was a huge success. The first day pop was very significant. They sold 28 million shares and they raised $3.4 billion. Three billion of that ended up in their bank account. Yep, because they sold into the market. Really mean, now they've got, you know, they had just raised a, a billion and a quarter. Now, one year later, they got three billion in the bank. And it made Snowflake the largest software IPO of all time. Breaking a 13-year-old record was, was VMware, which was then owned by Dell, because Dell bought VMware, which had raised a billion dollars. So at the closing of the IPO day, the price was $254 a share. Woo! $254, and the value was $70 billion. They are now a $70 billion in the stock market. It's time to go on a run and get more customers who see the legitimacy of Snowflake, and they don't see that just six years ago, 2014, they came out of stealth and were a relatively unknown company. And here we have CNN Business. I went back and found from <clears throat> uh, 3.30 a.m., September 17, 2020. So this is the next day after the IPO. Snowflake shares more than double. It's the biggest software IPO ever. So they went out in the high 120s, and they're all of a sudden 254 a share. Whoosh. So they're off and running, right? Well, let's go take a look at what off and running means. So 2020, there's the IPO. First, let's go run down the revenue line. 264 million. 2021, 592. Remember, these years is the January, so it's really the prior year. So 264 million year ending 2020, let's call that 19. 592 million in calendar 2020. 1.2 billion calendar 2021. 2 billion calendar 2022. And finally, 2.8 billion calendar 2023. Man, Tom, look at that. So you would think that they'd be profitable some way. Well, actually, 
they went from 2019 losing 348 million, 2020 they lost 539 million, 2022 they lost 679 million, 2023 they lost 796 million, and 2024, which would have been calendar 23, they lost 836 million. So guess what? Recently, you probably saw an announcement on the stock market that Lyft just recently went profitable. So these guys need to, to show software is normally crazy profitable. So these guys got to, got to make, get to a scaling point where they can get to profitability. That's the issue. Because to go from 264 million from calendar 2019 to 2.8 billion in calendar 2023, you know, that's four years. That's like, damn, that's 10x on your revenue line. Um, Whereas you're, you're continuing to bleed more at the net income line. Well, why is that? You gotta, you gotta get it together. So where are we going? Yep, investors are waiting for a comeback. And the comeback they're waiting for is they're waiting for that profitability. Look how they reacted. There's the IPO year, Yeehaw! Look where they are. They have another peak here. Here's COVID right here, there's COVID. So you might as well just look at this from here to here and take COVID out of it. But since that time, the market is kind of not very pleased and they're waiting for profitability, right? So take a look at this. On an all-time basis, if you had spent $100 on the IPO, right now you are at $53. So you've lost 22% of, of what you had. So for every, every dollar, you lost 22 cents. So that's no fun. That's not a return, especially when you're talking, you know, coming up on four years since the IPO now. So we're asking ourselves a question, you know, what is good with Snowflake? Now, let's go back and take a look at what happened this week. Remember I told you that they didn't really prepare the market for a CEO transition and they didn't give very good guidance for the next year or two? Yep, I did say that and we're gonna show you how the market reacted. So nonetheless, they seem to have a bright future. Customers are beginning to work their data. Customers are, are doing seven times the queries on their data, and this is information provided by Snowflake at an investor conference. And I took this slide from the slide deck from their investor conference. So this is as presented 2023 uh, Q3 by Snowflake, saying customers are now s paying Snowflake for seven times the queries because they pay for that processing when they run it um, at the data center on the Snowflake cloud. Okay, so that looks pretty good. And they believe that the market's not just 140 billion that it was just a short time ago. They believe the uh, calendar year 22, uh, two years ago, they believe that the market is going to be two times as big. So in calendar 27, which is only, you know, uh, three years from now. So they're thinking our customers are doing more analysis of our data. The market's going to double. So you would seem that it's bright. Instead, they go to transition and guidance and they do this. So they announce that Slotman will be succeeded by Shridhar Ramaswamy. Not that Ramaswamy, Shridhar is a guy who was a Google ad chief that joined Snowflake after a $185 million purchase of Neva, which was a startup that Shridhar Ramaswamy had built. And they said, hey, we bought this company, we like this guy, he's gonna be the new CEO, Slootman is actually gonna retire. Oh, okay. Then you get to guidance, but we're kind of conservative about 2024, which is our calendar 25, which is our fiscal year 25 ending in January. We're a little conservative about it, and we're not really sh sure that we can be as aggressive as we were in the past. Wait a minute, you just got finished saying your customers are doing seven times the queries. You just got finished saying that the total available market is actually 2x over the next three years. 27. You just got finished saying all those things, and then you get conservative when you say a new CEO's out there. Guess what happens? The analysts react strongly as the market reacted. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 225. A minute later, this is 180. That stock dropped $45 overnight. 
two days. And now it's settled at 185. And it's because they didn't like the transition. They like Slootman. He came from ServiceNow. He ran an IPO there. He ran a successful IPO here. But they're looking for growth. They're looking for answers. And you're running decks that say that your, your customers are doing seven times the queries and the TAM is two times bigger. And you, you can't manage to give guidance that's a little bit more you know, uh, optimistic. Well, maybe you don't have, maybe that's the right guidance they're giving. They just don't have uh, faith in their sales in our sales team right now. But anyway, the analysts reacted very strongly and Morgan Stanley threw a downgrade. Not some small analyst group. Morgan freaking Stanley threw the downgrade at them. And so that's how the market responded. So what's next? They got to grow into their stock price. Now they're, they're suffering where they got to regain confidence. The biggest software IPO of all time has to grow. And right now, they're 243 times forward earnings. So they're trading on the market 243 times forward. That's high, very high. Market share, they claim that they're somewhere between percent and a half and 2% of the, of the market. So there's opportunity to exploit, especially if you're a big dog. And they are now one of the big dogs. And the NVIDIA relationship was supposed to give you sale. Hey, these people want to use NVIDIA. Great, store it on Snowflake. Let's work together. What a great solution. We've got all this benefits for them, and we're a fast, easy, cost-effective cloud to do it in. Great, that was supposed to be this big marriage. They need to go harvest that. You're going to make press releases, and you're going to be there with Jensen on stage holding up a snowboard with everybody's logo on it and declare that you're together. We are family. Then, dug on it, you got to go make that work. So go cultivate that sales funnel that was supposed to be there. Profitability. You need to deliver OPEX and customer retention so you get earnings. OPEX needs to be efficient, and customer retention means they don't just use it one and done or one year and done, that they have multi-year subscriptions with their top customers. That's what has to happen for them to drive their stock price. And on top of this, all this needs to happen under the watch of the new CEO, Shridhar Ramaswamy, so that the market gives confidence in him the way it had at the IPO in Slootman. That's what they got to do. They have a great product, but you're a public company, and that's what public companies have to do to drive the price. Because the hype machine is over. You've been public for a while. We can see what's going on. We want to see you live up to your potential. And that's probably the highlight here. Live up to your potential under your new CEO. Restore not only investor confidence, but investor enthusiasm for the future. That is what I think has to happen at Snowflake. So what does that mean for you and me? You and I, running much smaller businesses, running things, what do we take out of this? Well, first of all, profitability. People with startups talk to me and they say quite often, BizDoc, Tom, when should I be profitable? And I said, well, you should be profitable on a unit customer basis. So when you sell one thing to one customer, that has to be profitable. Now, that may not pay for all your OPEX, all your software designing and building, um, stuff you have to buy. But it needs to be profitable on an individual basis, on individual transaction. And know what the target is for profitability. Know your formula. What is it that's in your formula that's going to scale and be consistent? And what is it do you have to pay for with multiple transactions, such as headquarters, marketing costs, your, your core staff, and things like that? Know your formula. Figuring out later, oh, we just got to get it sold. We got a bunch of customers are coming in and everything. Figuring out later, that's very risky. And leadership matters. You need to show leadership. Your customers need to have faith in you. Your team has to have faith in you. And any transition has to be managed very, very, very well. Obviously, they surprise the market a little too much. And they could say, well, we were providing guidance. We were talking that uh, Slootman would someday retire. Yep, but there's an awful lot of people that were writing articles that say they did not have a lot of notice and that the suddenness was surprising. So whether that's right or wrong doesn't matter. The transition has to be managed and over-communicated so everybody's ready for it. Look how much time they put in to Bill Gates' transition. 
into Jeff Bezos' transition. And some of you may not remember Bill Gates' transition to Steve Ballmer, because now even Steve has transitioned out. But Ballmer's transition was there. Even Sergey and Larry over at Alphabet Google, they managed to the transition. So you have to have market confidence in people that are coming up. And you have to do the same thing with your own team, whether you have five people or 55 people. Transitions have to be managed very carefully. Whether you're bringing someone in to a leadership position or you're stepping out away because you're retiring or whatever's going on. Lastly, customers. Narrow products are better than wide. It may be that Snowflake doing so many ancillary and additional things nowadays that maybe they gotta narrow it up and just focus on that Snowflake cloud. I don't know if that's a strategic decision, but guess what? Questions like that get asked when you have stock performance like we just saw and you have market response like we just saw. And ladies and gentlemen, those are the lessons for you and me. You don't have to have an IPO and a $70 billion valuation at the end of your IPO to know you have to focus on profitability, to understand leadership matters, and that your customers and how they buy and why they buy and what they buy need to be also carefully served so you get momentum with more customers tomorrow than you have today. And those are the lessons for you and me. And that is the story of Snowflake. And we hope it doesn't melt. We hope Snowflake's gonna be here and do well in the future. And I'm looking forward to it because I am a fan of the product. I think it's a best in class product. And I'm looking forward to them under new leadership demonstrating they can live up to the original promise of the largest software IPO in history that ended with that $70 billion valuation on day two. I hope they live up to it.